Welcome back to our weekly Bible study. And I'll tell you what, we had a, although temporarily a short-lived victory, a huge victory yesterday with the Supreme Court deciding that Texas had the right to secure the border and arrest those people that are coming illegally and send it back. Unfortunately, by the end of the day, the Fifth Circuit put a stumbling block on it. And so there's a temporary stay on it. The Fifth Circuit had already ruled on our behalf before. Uh, and now after the Supreme Court, we thought that was the end immediately. The hold on it. So the Fifth Circuit is going to hear it. I think it's not going to be until the 5th of next month, but we'll see. Nevertheless, it's a, it's a victory for the Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, Paragraph 3, gives clear authority to the states to take control of the border in the case of an invasion. And it's absolutely obvious that what we have at the border is an invasion. Mm -hmm. So uh, just be praying that God will open the minds of those people in the Fifth Circuit and that we will see this, this uh, ruling of the Supreme Court to be... Uh, so it's secured. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know, we were, I think we may have gotten as far as page 19 on this thing, but, you know, as I was looking at it, there's so much here. Uh, we got to go back. We got to go back because we have to walk on solid foundations. The Bible says that the foundations are destroyed. What can the righteous do? Well, so, you know, I want to go back to page 16 because uh, we, we need to understand that it is done. It is finished. When Jesus said at the cross, it is finished, it meant it is finished. He did it all. He did it all. So... Uh, in Romans 6, 8 to 10, it says, Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him, for in the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And then Romans 12, 6, 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you shall obey it in the loss thereof. And the key to this is to understand who we are. You know, this whole Bible study has been about identity. When it says, let not sin reign in your mortal bodies, it's not talking about you, but about your own will making sin not reign in your body. It rather means get it into your spirit of who you are and understanding who you are and that you have been freed not only from the presence of sin, but from the power of sin. That sin shall have no dominion over you because you have been freed from that dominion. And it's it says that in Romans six fourteen that you're not under the law, but under grace. And we need to understand the bondage in which the Jewish people lived throughout the Old Testament. It was all a system of laws, not just the Ten Commandments. There were 613 laws that they followed. And breaking any one of those 613 laws will put you under sin. That means they were always, always under condemnation. And if you are under condemnation, you cannot experience the fullness of the freedom there is in Christ. Of course, they had no revelation of Christ. So as I have mentioned before, they develop a system in order to try to kind of cover sin. Like close their eyes to the sin. And they developed this system of sacrifices that would temporarily cover sin. And it was very temporarily because they were going to sin again. So it was a constant rot. 
And I know I have talked about this before, but we need to understand not only the condemnation, but the futility of living under that system. It's futile because there's never any victory. The victory is very temporary, as a matter of fact, minutely temporary. And so it was a constant bondage to sin. And so, and this is what they call the law. And the law, I guess, in a limited sense, meant the Ten Commandments, but it, is, it was actually talking about 613 commandments. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, Jesus even put it into a higher level when he saw these people trying to justify themselves by the law. And he said, look, if you lost it as a woman, you already committed adultery. If you coveted somebody's goods, you already committed theft. And so he put it in a level that manifested what Paul said, all have sinned and for short of the glory of God. And the whole reason for that was to realize that the system of the law could not free anybody. That it would put you on the constant condemnation. You know, Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. It's interesting how these double superlatives kind of bring it to light, you know. And so that is talking about how can you have that if you're on the constant condemnation. So this is what Paul is talking about here. We need to come to the understanding that this system of the law could never bring you victory. All bring, that brings to you is the constant awareness that you're on the sin. That constant awareness that you're on the condemnation and therefore you're always defeated and you're always gloomy, and there is no victory. And unfortunately, we're not talking about just historical things. Many Christians today live under the same bondage. And uh, I'm not here to talk about denominations, but there are denominations that that's what all they are about. And whether you commit one sin or a hundred sins, you're under condemnation. And it's constant condemnation. And even some religions use that as a way of controlling their members and keep them under bondage. It's not about liberty, it's about bondage to the institution. Remember when Jesus talked about the church, he wasn't talking about an institution. He wasn't talking about a building. He was talking about a union with him. As a matter of fact, I think I may have shared with you before, you know, when Jesus was with the disciples at Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is one of the two Caesareas in the Bible. And uh, Caesarea Philippi was a Greek city, very idolatrous. This is where they had a deep pit where they threw babies to the devil. I've been there. I've seen that pit. And this, it, this was the place, and I know I've said this before, but uh, I'm trying to make a point, where Jesus asked the disciples, whom do you say that I am? And Peter made that glorious declaration, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal to you this, but my Father who is in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And contrary to what some denominations say, the rock was not Peter. The rock was the declaration of Peter. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the point I wanted to make is that he said, and upon this rock I will build my church. And church, he wasn't talking about an institution, he wasn't talking about a building. 
he was talking about a certain people, my church. And if we go back to the original language, in the time of Jesus, that word church, that word ecclesia, did not mean what preachers tell you today it means, the called out ones. No, no, that's not what it really meant at that time. The word church meant the ruling class, the governing body, the movers and the shakers, the ones who lead everybody else in that city state. That's what God has called the church today. Mm. Unfortunately, that's not what the church is today. The church has really become blind to what God meant. The church should be leading, not following. We should be the ones that should be at the forefront. Upon this rock, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. And will you understand the meaning of that word church? The ones who lead everything else, the rulers, you understand that what he said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That is not a passive statement. That's not even a defensive statement. That's an offensive statement. We kick down the gates of hell. We storm the gates of hell. The church is not doing that today. But we need to understand what God is telling us to do. Because I'll tell you what. We are facing dire days ahead of us. The church is going to be persecuted like it hasn't been persecuted. The attack against the church is going to increase. Not only I'm telling you that, the Bible tells you that. Read Matthew 24. There is more and more and more attacks upon the church. And that means we need to understand our identity. We need to understand who we are, and we need to understand that to whom much is given, much is required. We have been given a mantle. We've been given a responsibility. And to a great extent, we, the church, have failed. Have failed because the majority of churches across America and I'm not extrapolating when I say the majority, are just tickling men's and women's ears. The, the objective of the majority of the pastors, I'm sad to say, is just to tickle men's and women's ears, to make sure they don't offend anybody. Let's just sing Kumbaya together. Mm -hmm. And that's not what God has called the church to be. Mm -hmm. You know, in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All power or all authority in heaven and in earth has been given unto me. What are the next three words? The beginning of verse 19, Go ye therefore. So Jesus is saying, Because all power and authority has been given unto me, unto Jesus, therefore you go. You know what that is? That's a delegation of authority. That is a transfer of authority. God has delegated his authority to you and I to go on the authority and the power of the name of Jesus and take back the territory that the enemy has usurped. That's what God has called us to do. The majority of the Christians are not doing that. They just become spectators. And even beyond that, scared to death spectators. Amen. Spectators behind the chair or behind the wall. We need to be the head and not the tail. America is in the mess it is today because of the failure of the church. We need to realize, and, and I know I need to talk about the political process. Statistics tell us that... 50% of Christians in America are not even registered to vote. 50% not registered to vote. 
And of the ones that are registered to vote, only 50% vote. That means three out of every four Christians don't even vote. It is our fault. It is our fault. Do you realize if every Christian in America voted, and I voted according to the precepts of this book, we would elect committed Christians from the doghouse to the White House. Mm -hmm. It is our fault. But you know, there are so many preachers across America that have this excuse. I've heard it ad nauseum. God just called me to preach the gospel. And my question to these preachers is, what is the gospel? Because the gospel is a lot more than John 3.16. Well, you know, the Bible tells us we should not be involved in politics. Tell me where it says that. Have you even read the gospels? Jesus was a highly political figure. figure. Who did, he com com who did he confront? The political establishment and the ecclesiastical establishment. The powers that be, that those who, that the people he confronted. Head on. And majority of preachers don't want to make any waves. Well, I'll tell you what. The Bible says, the kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. It's about time we stop just being passive, singing kumbaya, and saying whatever will be, will be. That may be good for Doris Day or whoever sang that song, but that's not what God has called us to be. He has called us to be salt and light upon this earth. You're not doing that sitting across the idiot box watching whatever. No, we got to occupy till he comes. Read Luke chapter 17, the parable of the pounds. The master says to his servants, occupy till I come. And I've told you before, occupy is a military term. You occupy the hill. You don't occupy the valley. You get clobbered in the valley. But that means you have to climb the hill and you have to conquer the hill. There are many hills in front of us. And the problem, if we have grasshopper mentalities, we see every hill like a humongous mountain. It's a matter of perception. When you have a grasshopper mentality, every little hill seems like a mountain. You remember when the 12 spies went across, and they, it was only 10, 12 days after they left. And Moses sent them across to the promised land. And uh, 10 of the 12 spies come back, oh, it's a wonderful land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. But listen very carefully to the words. But we seem in our own eyes like grasshoppers. Mm -hmm. There are giants on the in the land, and we seem in our own eyes as grasshoppers. I want you to come to realize this. If you have a grasshopper mentality, even a blade of grass is like a giant tree. You think there's a problem with perception? Well, too many Christians have a problem of perception because they don't understand who they are or whose they are. We serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And with him on our side, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we need to change our cassette. We need to change the perception of who we are. See, we've been taught the wrong theology. We've been taught this wrong conception of humility to think of ourselves as nobodies. I'll tell you what, you're a child of the king. Mm -hmm. That means we're all prince or princesses. We're children of the king. 
But, you know, we have this false idea of humility. Oh, I'm a nobody. I'm nothing but a sinner saved by grace. No, you're not. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. You're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, we need to change our perception of who we are. Because as, so, as long as we think that we are nobodies, we're not going to be of any use in the kingdom of God. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we need to see ourselves as victorious. We fight from a position of triumph. The battle is already won. What were the last words of Jesus at the cross? It is finished. He did it all. So all we are to do is to enforce the victory that is already won. We're not even trying to win the victory. The victory is already won. But you see, if you walk in the mentality that you are defeated, you lost the battle before you get into it. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We need to change the way we think. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You see, we have had this incorrect perception of ourselves, and it comes from the wrong teaching of religion. The wrong teaching about humility. And they part with this thing of our humility is, you are nobody. You are nobody. And that, unfortunately, has become ingrained into many of us. And it is totally incorrect. You're not just somebody. You're a very important somebody. Jesus died for you. Individually for you. That's how much you're worth. So stop saying you're worthless. That's an insult to the sacrifice of Jesus at the cross. We need to personalize that sacrifice. He did it for me. He did it for me. And I've said it before, but I'm going to repeat it. If you had been the only person on this earth, Jesus would still have come to die for you. So stop saying you're a nobody. That's an insult to Christ. Amen. That's an insult to the sacrifice of Christ. And we excuse it as, oh, I'm so humble. No, you're stupid and you're ignorant. You're ignorant of this word. You're not just somebody. You're a very special somebody. Romans chapter 8 says that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are sons and daughters of the living God. So we need to change our perception of ourselves. And, you know, uh, I know I'm harping this point, but really this is a huge stumbling block to many Christians. It's this false humility that keeps Christians in total defeat. Because, and I'll tell you what, we were talking about politics before. It spreads into that. Well, what can, can one vote? I'm only one person. I'll just sit at home and watch the idiot tube. There are unfortunately, way too many Christians. Well, they're all a bunch of crooks. Why vote? But you need to vote for the least crooked of them all. I mean, you know, and, and as I say, we take scripture out of context and use it as a pretext to do whatever we want to do. We use the scripture to justify our not doing anything. And so we need to submit ourselves to what the word says, all the word. I've told you before, this book and Jesus are one and the same. This is Jesus speaking to us. Every word, every word is Jesus speaking to us. And he commands us to reign and rule, not over there, over here. We can't do that sitting on the couch. 
we can do that, and then what, whatever will be, will be. No, to whom much is given, much is required. We've been given an incredible responsibility. We live in the greatest country on the face of the earth. I mean, do you understand the privilege that we have to live in America? We are blessed beyond everyone on this earth. And we take it for granted. And we do nothing about it. Definitely. But I'll tell you what. As I said before, to whom much is given, much is required. That means we are stewards. We are stewards of this great country. And I'm sorry to say it, but most of us are failing in our stewardship responsibility. I mean, you'd be surprised how many people that we know didn't vote in the last elections. Well, I was too busy. I had a soap opera I was watching and whatever. And, you know, God is in control. Well, I've told you before, God is in control is an excuse. It's an excuse that Christians use to justify sitting on their rear end doing nothing while the country is going to hell in a handbasket. And I've told you before, I'm going to repeat it. God is in control. It's not biblical. Now, God is sovereign. God can act independent of us. God chooses not to do so. Instead, God chooses to work in partnership with us. We are stewards of all of God's creation. We are stewards of America. We have a stewardship responsibility over this country. And we're going to have to render an account for our stewardship. Just like you're a steward of your family. Just like you're a steward of your children. We're stewards of this country. And God gave us a process. And we need to be loyal. And realize that any time we walk or work or act contrary to what he's telling us, we are thwarting the purposes of God. Our answer to God needs to be, hear my Lord, send me. Hear my Lord, use, use me. The answer is, yes, Lord, what do you want? Instead of trying to argue with God as to why he doesn't mean me. He's talking about somebody else. You know, we're great about reading this book with a pair of scissors. Well, this verse doesn't really apply to me. Let me cut it out. I encourage you to read the last chapter of Revelation and what he says about those who add to this word or take away from this word. Yeah. It's pretty heavy. But you know what? We are very prone to do that. And we are very prone to be selective as to what verses of Scripture we choose to believe or not believe. Or even say, well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, Paul told Timothy, all Scripture, not some, all Scripture, has been written for you and is profitable to you. For instruction, for for reproof, for all kinds of things that God wants to use this word to guide you in every area of life. Let me tell you, we need to be in this word every day. Just like you eat food every day, you need to eat spiritual food every day. That's how I start my first thing I do in the morning, is be in this book. And I'm sure there are many in this room that do the same thing. I don't know if all in this room are doing the same thing, but you need to. This is where we start our day. And let me tell you, if you haven't been doing it, when you start doing that, first, first, how different your day is going to be. And how different your attitude about that day is going to be. It's a matter of priority. Now, there are some areas where there may be a little wiggle room, like, you know, David said, early will I seek thee. 
well, I think early is a relative term. For Phil, early is five o'clock in the morning. For me, it's nine. So <laughs> I, that's early for me. So, but that means first thing. The only thing I do prior to the Bible is fix me a cup of coffee so I'm awake when I'm when I'm looking at my Bible, you know. But that's it. This has to be first priority. Jesus will not take second place. He either is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And we need to decide. It's not a matter of when it's convenient. Do you know something? We need to understand that he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So we need to be constantly aware of his presence in our life. We need to walk with God consciousness. That will keep us a lot away from a lot of problems, you know. We have to be conscious, of not only his presence, but his direction in our lives. He wants to direct our every steps. You know, Proverbs 14, 12 and Proverbs 16, 25, both of them say the same thing. There's a way that seems right unto man, but its way is the way of death. You know, Jesus will tell you, it is this way, my child. And you say, no, 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 I'm going this other way. And he'll say again, it is this way, my dear. No, 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 I'm going this other way. And you can insist enough that he'll let you go that other way until you fall flat on your face. And you know the, the wonderful thing about God? When you fall flat on your face, he doesn't come with a pointing finger and saying, I told you so. Instead, he lifts you by the hand and says, come, my child, it is this way. We could avoid a lot of stumbles and a lot of falls if we would listen to him. Underline those two verses, Proverbs 14, 12, or Proverbs 16, 25. There's a way that seems right unto man, but its way is the way of death. You know, I think when God says it twice, he wants you to pay attention. And unfortunately, we want to emulate Flip Wilson. I did it my way. Or the devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make you do it. You made you do it. We need to understand that God wants to, to walk in his fullness. So, because of that, he says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the loss thereof. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. You're no longer living in that way that the Israelites lived in bondage to 613 laws. The grace of God has saved you, not because you deserved it, not because you kept the law, but because you were guilty like we all were. And Jesus took the penalty that we deserved. He became who we were that we may become who he is, and that was all by grace. And that means undeserved favor. It was not because we were worthy of it. It was in spite of the fact that we are totally unworthy. That's the grace of God. For God so loved the world. That includes you and I. So he did it for us in spite of the half fact that we didn't deserve it. So we need to understand that when you came to Christ, and this is a scripture that I've quoted probably a hundred times, 2 Corinthians 5.21. I don't know if there's any other scripture more important than that one. And it basically says that who you were is to exist. You're a new creation. You are a new creation. Who you were ceased to exist. He became sin that you may become righteousness. 
And today Jesus sees you as righteous as he is. And, you know, our false humility has a hard time understanding that. But let me tell you, and again, I'm repeating myself. If you were not as righteous as Jesus, the Holy Spirit could not reside in you. Because the Bible says that holiness cannot commune with the profane. So God had to make you in your spirit as righteous as him. So his Holy Spirit could commune with you, could reside in you. So we need to understand that the new birth, you, who you were, cease to exist. Forget what some denominations teach that you have two natures. And we're going to be talking a lot about that. All of chapter 7 deals with so many people that mis misunderstand and misstate Romans chapter 7. But you have two natures. You have a new nature and an old nature. That is wrong. That's garbage theology. No, you do not have two natures. Who you were died at the cross, and that became a reality for you the moment you came to Christ. Who you were ceased to exist. You became a new creation. That's what Romans 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation or a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Who you were ceased to exist. You became a new creation as righteous as Jesus. And this, as I said, is, is a really bo real bottleneck for most of Christendom. And that's why they live in bondage. Your nature of sin died at the cross. Remember, oh, it must have been a month, month and a half ago, we talk about the two key verses in verse in chapter six, chapter six, verse eleven and verse seven, in that order. Verse eleven says, "Reckon yourself." To be dead unto Christ, but uh, dead unto sin, but alive unto Jesus Christ our Lord. And I said that that word reckon is the word logizomai. And logizomai means count it as a fact that you're dead. And then you go back to verse 7. For he that is dead is free from sin. When you understand that you're Sin nature died at the cross, and that became a reality the moment you came to Christ. When you realize that sin nature is dead, that means sin has no power over you. You can reject to sin. The reality is you do not have to sin. You can be free from the power of sin. Why do people continue to sin? Because they don't understand who they are. Or whose they are. They continue to be in bondage to sin because of a lack of identity. This is why this study is so important. This is why we keep harping and harping and harping, and we can move even half a page. Because I'll tell you, if the foundations are not solid, they're going to crumble when persecution comes. For no other foundation can any man lay than that which already laid, which is Jesus Christ. This is why we're going so slow, because the foundations have to be solid. We need to, this is a, this is a point that I have to continue to harp on because it is critical. Your sin nature died the moment you came to Christ. That means you do not have to sin. Sin has no power over you. You know why? Because you're dead. Now, if you don't understand that you are dead, that who you were died, sin will eat your life. And you'll go back to Flick Wilson, the devil made me do it. So it is critical that we get into our spirit, Romans 6, 11, and then Romans 6, 7. I'll repeat him one, one more time. Romans 6, 11, reckon yourselves 
to be dead unto sin, but alive unto Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon, count it as a fact that you're dead unto sin. And then verse 7, for he that is dead is free from sin. Now that means free from the power of sin. It means free from the presence of sin. You do not have to be a slave to sin. But in order for you to be free from the power of sin, you have to understand those two verses. They need to become a reality in your life. Okay. So, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Your sin nature is dead. Get that in your spirit. Sin has no control over you, and you can reject sin. Okay. Now, let's get to Romans 6, 13, and we're going to turn a page onto something else. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but present yourself unto God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Now, twice in this verse it says your members. Now, your members is not like you would think your arms and your legs. Your members is talking about your soul. Your soul. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 says that you are a three-part being. Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. The only part of you that was redeemed at the cross was your spirit. You were made a new creation in your spirit. I think we're finally going to go to verse, page 17. So the only part of you that was transformed and made totally new was your spirit. Your spirit, as I said before, is as righteous as Jesus. Your spirit is the part of you that communes with God. Your spirit is a part of you where the Holy Spirit resides. Your spirit is a part of you that can worship God and be in perfect communion with him. Now, the problem is we live in a body, and we all know our body is not redeemed. I mean, our body gets old, it gets aches and pains, and, you know, and we have a soul. And the soul is composed of three parts. Will, mind, and emotions. Will, mind, and emotions. And that's where our problem lies. You know, so this is uh, what uh, says, present your members as instruments of righteousness up to God. And we try to do that by our own efforts. This is where we fail, you see. You know, if we look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23, that's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And it mentions there nine manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit. The last one is self-control. Well, I submit to you that's a lousy translation. I believe that what it should, should have been translated, Holy Spirit control. It's not you that control it, it's the Holy Spirit through you that controls it. And the problem is we misunderstand self-control. We understand self-control that I, I am going to control what I do. And no, no, we need to let the Holy Spirit be the one that operates in and through us. And so, we are trying to do good as an act of our own will. But the will is unredeemed. So we're going to have problems if we do it as an act of our will. This is where we we in, in, into trouble in this thing about being able to reject sin. It's we try to do it by our own self-control, by our own will, mind, and emotions. Now, I'm not saying we are, our motivation is bad. No, 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 our motivation is good. We're trying to get there. We're just doing it the wrong way. 
We're trying to do it by our own efforts. And we keep failing and failing and failing. And the more you fail, the more discouraged you get. And the more you're ready to throw in the towel. Now, you know, again, we need to not just read the Bible. We need to study the Bible. That means you need to get beyond the reading to understand what the Bible is telling you. Another verse that is very misunderstood in the Bible is in the book of James, where James says, faith without works is dead. And I like the way my friend Kenneth Copeland interprets that verse. And Kenneth Copeland says, the way we should read that verse is, Faith without corresponding action is dead. See, it's not works, it's not what we do, it's the actions that that faith leads us to do. The corresponding action is directly coming from the faith, it's not the other way around. It's not our works trying to promote faith, but it's a faith leading us to have a, an outcome of that walk of faith. Am I making some sense? And so, you know, we find that we try to do this, we try to do this by our own efforts, and we keep failing, and we keep failing. And the more we fail, the more disheartened we are. And the more we say, well, we're fighting a losing battle. We're fighting a losing battle. And so we need to understand that when you came to Christ, all that was redeemed was your spirit. Your spirit is as righteous as Jesus. And as I said a minute ago, we live in a body, we have a soul, mind, will, and emotions, and that's unredeemed. So that means we need to bring that under the control of the Holy Spirit. So, let's start with the mind. We need to renew our mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I know I have I've mentioned these verses before. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, my brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and perfect will of God, an acceptable will of God. So, the Bible calls us to renew our mind. How do you renew your mind? It's only one way. Ephesians 5.26, by the daily washing of the water by the Word of God. we got to be in the Word of God every day. That's how you renew your mind. You see, uh, uh, there's a lot of garbage in this mind. I've shared to you before, I didn't come to Christ till I was 37 years old. There's a lot of bad programming up there. And if I am not walking in the Spirit, that bad programming will come to light. And I could start acting according to who I was. So we need to renew our mind. And that's not a one-time deal. That's a daily process. How do you renew your mind? By the daily washing of the water by the word of God. Joshua 1, eight. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. That you shall do according to all that's written therein. Then everything you do will prosper. So we have to be in the word of God daily, daily, daily washing. Because we got constant input into that mind from the outside. All of us are exposed to all kinds of negative input. Not just from conversations with other people. Just all you have to do is turn the TV or turn the radio. You get a lot of negative input. So you have to renew your mind with the Word of God to keep your mind in perspective. 
and this is a daily process. This is why, again, it's important that we be in the Word of God every day. Once a week is not enough. Every day. As a matter of fact, we need to get to the point that we walk in the Spirit constantly. Paul says, walk in the Spirit, and you will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. See, because the desires of the flesh, remember the flesh is Paul's uh, way that he talks about the soul. The flesh means the soul, mind, will, and emotions. And the flesh will take you in a direction opposite. Because the flesh, the soul, is unredeemed. Am I making sense? So that means that we need to be in the word daily. In the word daily. And uh, we try, the, the, and, and where we fail is we try to do it by our own efforts. We try to use sex self-control about my trying to, to force myself to do the right thing. We need to get to the point that we understand that it's self-control really means Holy Spirit control. The way to victory is to render to the will of God. The way to victory is to have that control be under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Let it be Holy Spirit control. See, self has to be submitted to Him because self can be manifested through the soul, mind, will, and emotions. And so, and of those three, the most fickle of them all is emotions. So you got to control your emotions, and that's where your will come, comes into play. I mean, have you ever been guilty of open mouth, change foot? Because somebody says something, and before you even think, you lash out. Open mouth, change foot. And, you know, this is why, you know, there's a good secular advice, which is very wise. Count to 10 before you respond. And that means just give it time to where you do not allow emotions to be the ones that trigger the response. But you allow your will to overcome the emotions, because the problem is uncontrolled emotions will get you into all kinds of trouble. I don't know if you have never been there. I sure have. And every time that happens, you regret it afterwards. And you say, oops. Well, so too, some of us have had to say oops way too many times. And sometimes you cannot undo the harm that you have done. So we need to get beyond the oops, or before the oops, and allow our will to overcome our emotions. So how does that happen? That happens more and more as you spend more time on this book and allow the Word of God, which is the presence of God, be manifested in your life and allow him to be the one who directs you. This has to happen on a daily basis. We cannot afford to be doing it by our own will, but we need to allow it to come through the Holy Spirit controlling our mind and our will becoming a manifestation of the, of the will of God. Now, that's not natural. That means you need to be submitted to him. This is why it's so important that we spend time in this book, that we spend time in prayer. And I've told you before about prayer. Prayer is not about give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Prayer should primarily be about communion with God about intimacy with God, about our just becoming aware of His presence, immersed in His presence, communing with Him. And 
as we commune with him and we become one with him, he will speak to us. He delights in speak to us. We're way too busy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't have time to just come into his presence and allow him to speak and to direct our path. He delights in directing us, in leading us into his path of righteousness. Well, before we finish, we still have some elections coming up within the next month. There are some uh, primaries that uh, went into runoffs that are still about to take place. We have friends, committed Christians that are involved in runoffs right now. I think we need to spend the last five minutes in prayer. So whoever feels led to pray, let's pray for for a positive outcome on this election and the righteousness will prevail and we'll see righteous people be elected. Chandra, why don't you start? Father God, we just thank you for the revelations, Lord, that you are bringing to us. Not just uh, who we are in your son, Jesus Christ, but what we have and to have and to actually use what we have, Lord, that it come in full manifestation. And we lift up your people, Father God, that you risen up that are in the runoffs lord that are bold that dare to stand up against the devil dare to push back the gates of hell that they're standing up against the establishment they're standing up against evil father god and they dare to stand up for you we lift them up right now in the name of jesus for protection favor that they rise above all of the devices of the enemy that they come in victory, Father God, that those are attentive to the runoff, Lord, that the ministering angels go forth and get everyone's attention, Father God, to come to the runoffs, to vote, to participate, to manifest, to take the steps, to put your people in position, Father God, put them in the position so they can push back the gates of hell and supporting them and that more rise that father yes to support these individuals yes father father god we just ask that you uh you fortify the uh the spines of christians across this land uh to get off the bench and get in the game uh before uh, this nation slips through our fingers and the way we can most effectively do that is be informed, help others informed, and and cast our vote. Yes. Because uh, if we don't, we have cast a vote for the other side. Give us victory, and we'll give you all the glory in Christ's name. Jesus would call the churches and say, rise up. Rise up, churches, men of the black robe. Father, rise up into your position and call forth what you know to be truth in life. Father, I pray that they would start speaking truth from the pulpit about elections, about candidates, about the direction that our nation is going to. Father, and that, Father, that we will push back the gates of hell. But Father, you have called us for such a time as this, and we take back this nation for you. Yes. You have given us dominion over this land, and we take dominion in your name, Jesus. Father, I thank you for every candidate that has risen up to fight and to run in these positions. Father, for Jays, for David Covey, for um, Andy Hopper, for all the ones throughout the state that are in runoffs, Father, for the municipal races, Father, I pray that, that you would be just with each of those candidates that know you, Father, give them strength, Father. Give them people to help them run these races, Father. And I pray that we take over the school boards, the city councils, Father, our, our state, our um, D.C., Father, we take over these positions for you, that you will be high and lifted up in our nation once again. Father, I thank you for, um, for what you're doing through all of the people who are fighting, who are in the trenches, who are at war for you, for this cause, Lord. And I pray that you give them strength Give them wisdom beyond their years. Give them strategy, Father. And I just thank you for um, for letting us be a part, Father, for calling us during this time. It is special that you have let us 
be born during this time and that you have called us for such a time as this. It's not by accident. Everybody in this room, everybody who's hearing this, Father God said that this is your time. This is your time to shine for him. And Father, we thank you for that. We're going to we're gonna fight. Fight till the end, Jesus, for you. And we thank you, give you glory in Jesus' name. And Father, Lord God, I pray, Father, for the right decisions to be made on this issue in the border, Father, that we may finally put a stop to this invasion that is coming across the border, not only with with the people that are coming illegally to commit all kinds of crimes on this in this country, but Lord God, the amount of drugs that are destroying our youth, Father. And we pray, Lord God, that you'll put an end to it, Father, yes. and that righteousness may prevail, Father. Yes. We give you an, the honor and the glory and the power in the name of Jesus, Father. Give us righteous leaders and give us righteous decisions that you may be glorified and that America's greatest days may still be ahead to your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen.